to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Tonight we're going to be looking at the last half of Romans chapter 14, from verses 13 down to 23. Romans 14, verse 13 down to 23. Let's read together. It says, Therefore let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he believes. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Lord, tonight as we come to the study of your word, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth. We ask you, God, to bring application to our hearts, to each individual heart and each individual life. We ask you, God, to bring us to a place of maturity, to a place where our minds are transformed, God, by your word, where we are changed into the image of Christ, where we are made more like Him each day. And Lord, I pray Your blessing on this time. I ask Your anointing upon me, and I ask Your anointing upon Your people. I ask You, Holy Spirit, speak into our lives tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our look in Romans chapter 14, we are looking at this great reality within the church, that in the midst of of the church where the Holy Spirit and the Lord has told us to walk in unity and to maintain the unity of the faith, that in the midst of all of that, there is great diversity. And as the body of Christ is made up of individuals that are born again, people that are washed in the blood of Christ, and we come from various backgrounds, we come from different traditions, some of us grew up in much different traditions and much different backgrounds than other people. We come from different social and economic settings and many of us come from a different place in regards to our personal convictions. And the last week we began looking at what God's Word has to say to us about these differing personal convictions and these differing Christian liberties that each of us have. And I want us to understand here that within this chapter, the Apostle Paul is not addressing things that are absolutely fundamental or fundamental issues. I want you to understand there are certain things within God's Word where there is no compromise. Meaning that if you do not believe certain things, you are not saved. There are certain behaviors within the Word of God that are prohibited, that bring condemnation, that the Word of God clearly says are sinful, and that if you partake and live a lifestyle within those certain actions of living, that you will not go to heaven. And there are certain clear things that are prohibited by Scripture. And there are certain clear doctrines that are laid down in God's Word that you must believe in order to be saved. 
But then there are areas that we have looked at, and then there are certain things in Scripture, there are certain things that people believe that are a personal conviction, that are a personal preference, that are something that their conscience will not allow them to partake of, but Scripture does not clearly say that it is sinful or that it is wrong. And we looked at this in the last week and we talked about this in great detail. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 1, it says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And we see here that God's Word tells us that we are to receive or to accept those who are weak in the faith. And He he tells us here that we are to accept them and we are to receive them, but not to disputes. That we, in regards to the weaker brother, the one who has a weakness in his conscience that does not allow him because of his past life or the past lifestyle that he once lived, now he's been set free by the gospel, but his conscience is not informed by the gospel and he is not at liberty as of yet to partake of certain things. And so he does not partake of the meat sold at the meat market here in Rome because it was sacrificed to an idol. In his past life, the conviction or the way that he lived before will not allow him to partake or indulge in that. And the Word of God says, it tells us here, that there were two different types of people, the strong and the weak, and they are, not to, they are to receive and accept one another, but not to disputes over doubtful things. The doubtful things there are things that are not essential. These are things that really at the end of the day are not the fundamental essential things of the faith. Why spend all of your energy arguing over things at the end of the day that don't really matter? And that is here what the Apostle Paul is addressing. We are to receive them, not despising one whose conscience is weak or who is weak, and not judging one who feels the freedom to partake of that. And he tells us, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And we see that he goes on in verse 5, One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And as we looked at this last week, we saw that we are to accept the non-essentials and realize... This verse makes it very clear that you can have a different opinion than me over things that aren't essential. Because he says here, let each be convinced in his own mind. Let each hold to his own convictions. And that's a powerful thing to realize. That you don't have to agree on every single point. In fact, there are many pastors and many preachers that I listen to that bless me on a regular basis, but I don't agree with everything that they say or even everything that they believe. They come from a different background, a different tradition. They do things a little bit differently. That doesn't mean I can't be blessed by them or listen to them or receive from them. Amen. God help us if we only listen to people that look like us, only listen to people that sound like us, and only listen to people that have our particular background and tradition. You see, we are to be convinced in our own mind and to receive one another and to realize that on non-essentials, you can have a different opinion. Remember, we're not talking about the fundamentals. We're not talking about things essential. We're not talking about clearly outlined scriptural principles laid down that there is no wiggle room on. We are talking here of doubtful things or things that are not essential. And we do this, verse 7, it says, For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And then he would say as he goes on, he tells us in verse 10, 
that we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. That the thing that brings unity and the thing in the midst of these varying diverse opinions over certain convictions and certain things that they hold to be important, that it is okay. It is okay because the thing that holds us together is the Lordship of Christ. And the lens through which we view our brothers and sisters is that each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what you have done. I will give an account. I am accountable, not for you, but for me. You are accountable, not for me, but for you. And so here, this is our motivator. We do this and we operate in unity under the Lordship of Christ. And then here tonight, as we move forward looking at this, I want to show us what our attitude should be and how we work this out as God's people. As Paul goes on in verse 13, and here he is talking in regards to our personal convictions. He's talking here in regards to the things that we, we feel at liberty to do that other people may not feel at liberty to do. But here is what he says to us. Therefore... Let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. He tells us here that we are not to pass judgment anymore, realizing that we all will give an account to God, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But what he says here, he says to us that we resolve not to be a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. And Paul tells us here, don't be a stumbling block. Resolve not to be a stumbling block. A stumbling block is something that is put in somebody's path that makes them trip that hinders them, that makes them stumble, that makes them fall, that offends them. It is something that keeps them from moving forward in their walk with God. And you and I, even though we have freedom, even though we feel no conviction over a certain behavior, even though we have a preference toward a certain way, if it causes my brother, if it causes my sister to stumble, I will not take advantage of my liberty. Out of love, I will not put a stumbling block in their way. And this is the mindset that we are to have. If a weaker brother or a weaker sister is made to stumble over my freedom, I will never do it again. I myself... And there's a great deal of examples that we could use in regards to this. And I just want to make one example that I will use... Now, I have a very, 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 very strong personal conviction as a Christian, as a pastor, that you should not partake of alcohol at all. I don't think anyone who is a Christian should drink. That is a personal conviction of mine. That is something that I hold to. I am fully convinced in my own mind. And we see here the strong warnings in Scripture. First of all, if you are a drunkard, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is clear within God's Word. If you drink to the point of excess where it causes you to be a drunkard and brought under the bondage of alcohol, God's Word tells us that a drunkard will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is clear. We see all these different principles and warnings laid down in the book of Proverbs where it talks about drinking strong drink. It talks about not looking on the wine, why it swirls in the cup, and at the end it will bite like a viper. And we see just all of these dangers by drinking alcohol. We see all the foolishness and the folly that comes about even by thinking I can only have one small drink or I can do this and it will take the edge off. Listen to me, I don't think you should need alcohol as a believer to take the edge off of your life. That is a deep personal conviction of mine. And the reason why I hold that conviction is because of the background that I came out of. I came from a background of that. I was brought out of that. And I see the danger in that. I've seen so many people partake or go down that road, even as Christians, and it leads to things that are bad. Backslide. 
And I think each of us can probably tell a story of knowing that. But we see here and we know that there are certain backgrounds and certain traditions and even denominations. And listen to me, I believe, I believe, as even though I am deeply passionate about not drinking and encouraging people, and I wouldn't even want to give the impression that it was okay, but I do know this and understand this, that not everybody agrees with me on that. That there are brothers and sisters who within the bounds of not sinning partake of that. I know that. But my view upon it is this. If I saw within this culture that we live in, within the background of America, Christianity and evangelicalism within America, alcohol has always been viewed as bad and evil. And people get delivered out of that when they come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if they walked into a restaurant, that brother or sister that was an alcoholic, that brother or sister that was in bondage to that, they walk into a restaurant and they saw Pastor John with a beer bottle in his hand. And then they became emboldened thinking, hey, well, Pastor John drinks. Maybe it's not that bad. And they fell back into that sin. You see, I have become a stumbling block. I have become a reason for a brother or sister to fall. And you could list various different reasons. You could, you could come up with various different things. That's called, that is what being a stumbling block is. You may have the liberty, you may feel no conviction over it, you may be able to indulge in it and do it within the realm of self-control and all of these things. You may feel the liberty to do that. But yet, if your freedom causes a brother or sister to stumble or fall, you're no longer operating in the realm of love. And here's what he says. Verse 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. And he says here, nothing in itself is unclean. I'm convinced that there is nothing unhallowed. And here he is talking within the context of food. And obviously there are certain behaviors and actions that are unholy and that are condemned and prohibited, but here he is speaking of these external actions with food and certain things, and he is saying nothing in and of itself, just by its nature, is inherently unclean or unhallowed. But if you consider it to be, to you it is. To you it is. If your conscience condemns you over something, then to you it is off limits. To you it is. Even though your conscience or the conscience of somebody else is not condemned by it. And then he says in verse 15, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken evil of. And here we see Paul says in verse 15 that if you and your freedom destroy because of your desire to hold on to your freedom and you say, hey, why don't you just get over it? You're too uptight. Why don't you just get over it? This is not a big deal, weaker brother. You should get over it and let me be and walk in the liberty that I am allowed to walk in in Christ. And you have no regard for your weaker brother. You are no longer walking in love. You're no longer, and this is what he says, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. This is the attitude that we are to have. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul addresses this very thing. He says in verse 8, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat... 
are we the better, nor if we do not eat, are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak weak conscience, you sin against God. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. You see here the motivation. You see here the thing that is to be the underlying of everything, that if I cause somebody to stumble by my external behavior, if I cause a brother or sister to stumble or not draw closer to Christ because of something I am doing within the liberty that I may feel that I have, I'm no longer walking in love. And I love what Paul says here. He says, if food makes my brother stumble, I'll never again eat meat. I'll let my liberty go for the sake of my brother. Amen? Amen. And he says in verse 16 of Romans, Therefore do not let your good be spoken evil of. If we in our freedom flaunt our freedom to our weaker brothers, its result will be that our good is spoken evil of. It would be slandered and it would be counterproductive. We walk in love toward our brothers and sisters and we do not. We resolve this. I will not be a cause for my brother or sister to stumble. I won't be a cause. I resolve not to be a stumbling block. Amen. That's that's being brought to a place of maturity where we want to walk in such a way that it endears people to Jesus. It draws them closer to Christ. It makes them draw closer to Him, not stumble over us, not stumble over our behavior. And then he goes on in verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He shows us here what the focus is to be for us. The focus is to be the kingdom of God. The focus is to be on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The focus of the kingdom of God is not on these externals. Christ died, did not die for us to be consumed and to spend all of our time focusing on these external things. That is not what the kingdom of God is made of. It is not to be having this nitpicky attitude about everything. Well, we, your, your skirt's not long enough. Your hair's not long enough. Brother, shave that beard. I've literally had people say things like Christians shouldn't have a beard. And I, I just wonder, I, I wonder, have you ever read the Bible? That is a tradition. That has no place within God's Word. That is a tradition laid down by the certain American cultures. I'm not going to go on a rant, but I could right there. But you need to understand that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The focus there is not on the externals. That is not what is the main thing. The main thing is not externals, but the eternal things. The main things are not external things, but the eternal things. The kingdom of heaven is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. Righteousness. This is the focus. The kingdom of heaven is about righteousness, bringing you into a right standing with God. Bringing you into a place where you are brought to justification by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then from the inward heart, by being born again, you live out a righteous life. That is what the kingdom of God is concerned about. Righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That is what the kingdom of God, the main focus is. 
You who were unclean, you who were dead in sin, being reconciled back to God and declared righteous, and now you are able to live a righteous life. That is what the kingdom of God is about. Righteousness. And then peace. Peace. Peace with God. This peace of God that comes to you when you are at peace with God. Through Christ, who is our peace. Having peace with God. This peace that is ours in Christ, even when all of the world around us is in turmoil. His kingdom rules in our hearts. The peace of God rules in our hearts. That is what the kingdom of God, that is what the focus should be on. Righteousness and peace. And joy, joy, joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy is the outward mark of Christ's presence on the inside of our life. Joy is the outworking of a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. Christian people should be, listen to me, Christian people should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. And I'm not talking about a superficial happiness. I'm not talking about a happiness that is based on how everything is in your life. I am talking about a joy that comes from the inside, from the presence of the Holy Spirit being on the inside of you. A joy that is unspeakable, meaning it's inexplainable. A joy unspeakable and full of glory. Someone gave the example. The Queen of England, when she is at Buckingham Palace, you know that she is there when her flag is flying out. There's a certain standard that flies outside. And you see joy on the outside is one of the greatest indications of the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. Joy. The kingdom of heaven is not eating and drinking. It's not focused on all of these external things, these nitpicky things that turn you into a Pharisee if that's all you are focused on. But the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen? Man, when people get back to church, I, you better amen me all day long. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verse 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. When this is our focus, when this is our focus, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God. When we serve Him in this way, realizing the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, when that is our focus, we are acceptable unto God and approved unto men. And this is where our focus should be. And then he says in verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. You see, verse 17 and 18, we focus on the kingdom of God. In verse 19 and 20, look at what he says here. We pursue things that make for peace. Pursue peace and the things which edify. These are the things that we pursue. Pursue the things that make for peace. Things that bring unity. Understanding what unites us. Understanding our call to reach the lost. Understanding the Lordship of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. These are what we pursue. We pursue the things that make for peace. You realize today, we understand that the enemy's desire is to divide the body. The enemy's desire is to bring about strife. The enemy's desire is to cause dissension. Usually when a church is thriving and going well and things are happening and clicking, that's when you start to see these type of things. But here Paul tells us we are to pursue the things that make for peace. 
Pursue the things that make for peace. Not compromising certain critical doctrines. Never. But if there is something that is causing somebody to stumble, brother, stronger brother, let it go. You who are stronger, mature, for the sake of peace, let it go. Amen? Amen. I live in a household with three children who are quarantined right now. And the only time they get out of the house right now is to come to church or to go on a walk with Dad. And uh, I go on long walks, so many times they don't look forward to it. But one thing that you see, and I'm going to embarrass one of them, is that you see an older one arguing with a younger one, a much younger one. And I tell him, you know what happens when you argue with a six-year-old? You're becoming just like the six-year-old. You're the more mature one. See, no one's in the church, so no one can look at him, so it's good. But you see, we pursue the things that make for peace. And things that edify. Things that build up. Things that strengthen. These are what we pursue. Things that build up our brothers and sisters in the faith. Things that edify them. Make them stronger in their walk with God. We encourage one another. We stir one another up to faith and good works. This is what we do. This is what we pursue. We pursue peace and for the things that build each other up, not the things that cause each other to stumble, not because of our selfishness and our freedom that we have in Christ that our weaker brother doesn't have, and we flaunt that freedom and we cause it to be a source of contention and stumbling. No. No. We pursue those things that make for peace. Then he says, verse 20, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. He comes back to this very thing again. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Paul again touches on this. Don't destroy God's work over non-essentials. Verse 21, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. You see our motive once again. He comes back to this. Don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a source that makes your brother weak. Don't be a cause for him to stumble or a cause for him to fall. Pursue the things that make for peace. Pursue the things that build one another up within the body of Christ. You see this practical outworking of the Christian life within the realm of the body of Christ, within the local church, these things that the Apostle Paul addresses. He dealt with these things even in the first century. These are things that you and I put into practice even now. And then he says lastly in verse 22 and 23, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. And lastly, he tells us that whatever we do, whatever we do, we should do it with a clear conscience. Whatever you do. He says here, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. We see that if what we believe about neutral and these non-essential issues is It's between us and God, and it's something that you can keep between you and God. 
It's something that you can keep between you and God. You can hold to that conviction. Certain people have a certain conviction on different things. Have it before. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is the one who does not condemn himself in what he approves. You see, we are blessed when we are not condemned in matters of things non essential, when our conscience is free from guilt over what we approve. But then he says in verse 23, but, if, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. And he explains it in this way, that if you have this certain conviction, if you have this certain point in your conscience that tells you not to do something, And listen, if you go against it, as he said, if you think it's unclean, if you think it's sin, to you it's sin. To you it is sin. Because you're going to partake of that or indulge in that or do that thing, and the whole time your conscience is screaming at you, don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it. So if you have a certain conviction and peer pressure pushes you into something and afterward, you see you're not doing it from faith. You're not doing it from a place of cleanness or a place of clarity in your conviction. You're doing it against your conviction. And when you partake of it, immediately your conscience condemns you. Whether it doesn't matter, if it's a non, even in a non-essential If you do it from a place that is not faith, it's sin. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If I have a deep conviction over something, and and I'm going to do it, everybody's doing it, I think, well, I should do it, I should do it, everybody's doing it, it's not that big a deal, not that big a deal, and the whole time I feel, it's not right, it's not right, it's not right, and I do it from that motive, from that vantage point, from right there, It's sin. It's not from faith. You see, everything that we do, as Paul said, he always strived to live his life with a conscience that was free from offense. That when he laid his head down at night, he didn't have any guilt He didn't have any conviction on his conscience. And we should live our lives, even in regards to these non-essentials, these personal convictions, striving to keep our conscience clear. Not pressured into anything that goes against what we believe or what our conscience tells us. You see here, this is love's outworking among God's people. That we resolve, we resolve, first of all, not to be a stumbling block for our brothers and sisters. I don't want to be a cause for you to fall. I don't want to put something in your way that hinders your walk with God. We resolve as brothers and sisters in Christ not to be a stumbling block, a cause for somebody to stumble. Secondly, we realize that the main focus, we should focus on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not these external things, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that is what we focus on. That is the main thing. We keep the main thing the main thing. Focus on the kingdom of God. Thirdly, we pursue peace and the things that build each other up. That's what we should pursue. Pursue the things that make for peace and build each other up. And then lastly, we strive to have a clean conscience. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever is not from faith is sin. 
Let's pray tonight. Lord, we love you, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your precious word. Lord, tonight I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would bring application to the hearts of those who have listened tonight, to those who will watch it later. Lord, I pray that you would bring understanding. And Lord God, help us. Help us to walk in love toward one another, not to be a stumbling block, Lord, but to build each other up, to strengthen one another, encourage one another. Help us, God, to walk in the love that you have called us to walk in. Lord, we bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We encourage you to be with us on Friday evening for our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock. We encourage you, we're going to be receiving communion, so if you have some juice or some crackers or any elements that you can use for communion, we encourage you to do so. Uh, If you need those, we just reach out to me. We will make sure that we can get that to you so you can join us and take part in that. If you need anything, if you need to talk, whatever you may need, please call me. Please call me. Reach out to me. And I will do my best to meet whatever need you have. We will do our best to see that you are taken care of. And we encourage you to continue to be faithful in your tithing and your giving. And you can either mail your tithe in or go on our app on our Facebook page or website. And we love you so much and we'll look forward to being with you on Friday. Be blessed. See you next time.